And there you have the official um, notice. Um, just trying to see if I can, should be able to turn on my video as well. There we go. Okay. Um, can you see my screen, Alec? Am I of seeing the, the slide? Come through just fine. Okay, great. Uh, so welcome everyone to this is our, going to be our second demonstration of, um, of, uh, of open preprint systems. Uh, it's great to have had the opportunity to um, put on this event during the Open Publishing Fest. And so thank you for all of the organizers who have been doing a great job of sort of getting all of the um, sort of events off the ground, making it so easy just to propose a session and to get it on. And for what has turned out to be a pretty um, uh, remarkable lineup with all kinds of interesting things. Uh, and so welcome to all of you and thank you for your interest in learning a little bit more about what we've been doing uh, at uh, PKP in particular with regards to to open preprint uh, to open preprint systems. Um, before sort of I get going into the uh, into the actual presentation into the meat of it, uh, I want to sort of let you know we're going to be doing sort of two things. It's going to be a little bit similar to the demo we did about a month ago, um, launching open preprint systems, um, where we talk a little bit about PKP in particular and about um, about what PKP has been doing and about uh, and showing you what open preprint systems has been all about. Presenting today will be me, Juan Pablo Alperin. For those that don't know me, I'm Associate Director of Research at the Public Knowledge Project, as well as an Assistant Professor at the School of Publishing at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and Alex Metcher will also be uh, joining us, um, uh, who's the Associate Director of Development um, uh, at PKP and, and has been really sort of working and leading all of the software side of, uh, of everything that PKP has been doing for over a decade now. And I also just want to acknowledge as well, um, the, the contributions to open preprint systems in particular, uh, to Cielo, who has been a partner as well as a supporter of the project since the, since the beginning. And I'll talk a little bit more about their role as well as share a little bit some of the experience of what they've been doing over the last month since they launched their preprint uh, uh, software. Um, to an anonymous Stanford donor who's uh, been contributing directly to the development of, uh, of open preprint systems and to, and to UC Nygaard, who has been really the primary developer um, of, of the software and building on the rest of the PKP suite, but he's been really leading the OPS development. Um, and as well as an acknowledgement just of the rest of the PKP team, which all of this all sort of comes together as not just the, um, not just the application on its own, but it wouldn't be possible without the rest of the application library, without the rest of everything that the PKP team has been doing. So just a thank you and acknowledgement of all of their work. Um, while Alec here and I here are gonna be the face of PKP for today, it really is a, a whole team that's sort of working to make sure everything gets off without a hitch in, in the background. I also wanna talk a little bit um, uh, about the, let me see if I can actually just put it into, um, I'm going to see if I can put it into presenter mode so that I can, and then I'll let Alec manage the, um, the way you don't start seeing all of the spelling mistake. Can you still see the, can you see a full screen, Alec? Can you just confirm That's good that now, yeah. it's not into the, like, just in the back, so it should be in presenter mode. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, the public knowledge project um, and some of the things that we do, because I think it's quite essential for while we talk about the preprint software in particular, and I know that people are here wanting to see a demo, so I'll want to, try to sort of go through quickly some of the, the background stuff about who we are, um, because I think it's kind of essential to give that context about um, the preprint software not being just a software that lives sort of on its own and it's an application for people to take up um, without, uh, you know, just as they would any software that they download off the web, but to understand a bit about the group that's behind it, the philosophy behind the project, what it means for us to take on a project like preprints and what it would mean for anyone interested in adopting the platform of sort of what is the community and what are the people that are behind that um, that are behind the software itself so i'll just try to go through quickly and tell you a little bit about what it is that the public knowledge project does for those that are not familiar and in particular talk about the ways um, and the aspects of pkp that have been at the heart of what's behind the preprint uh, the preprint software PKP's mission, um, which we've been doing for over 20 years now, uh, which is also just crazy to think that we've been around for, for, for that long, has been working to increase the quantity and the quality of knowledge that's available to the public. I mean, it's right there in, in the name. It's all about a public knowledge, but it's really about both increasing the quantity and the amount of knowledge that's available to the public, but also helping to support and improve the quality of that knowledge that's available. 
and we've been part of increasing that that quality is also about increasing the quality and the, and the amount of sort of global participation that goes into knowledge production. In particular, we've been focused very much within the research space and the, the creation of global participation into research knowledge production and sharing and, and making that available as broadly as, as possible. There's three aspects of what we do. I think most people uh, that are, anyone that's heard of PKP um, has mostly been uh, is familiar with our software. So we do do open source software of which most, most famously open journal systems. And most recently now this preprint software that we'll talk about today. And we provide this free open source software to anywhere and anywhere. Um, and really it's as a means of lowering the barriers to creating, to presenting, to sharing a different scholarly content. But that's not everything that we do. We also have a research education and advocacy mission. Um, we are an academic-led initiative with, uh, with, you know, based out of a university with the directors and, and people working either, you know, from academic positions um, like myself. Uh, and we're firmly part of this group that we're trying to observe and influence. We're not an outside group coming in to try to change scholarly communication from the outside. We are really trying to make changes to how scholarship is done uh, as, uh, as we try to change our own, uh, our own practices. Um, and so as such, so we read, we do research on scholarly communications and the, the research group that I lead, the scholar, uh, scholarly communications lab is a big part of that and, and all the work that John Walensky and other people on the team are also undertaking as part of understanding more about research communications. Uh, we try to teach and develop educational materials through the PKP school around how to do journal publishing and, and how to do uh, sharing of, of content and we do advocacy as well as you know doing research and understanding of different economic models uh, trying to advocate for open access in general and try to be a voice for the community and trying to support open access to scholarship and other open science practices. and the third pillar of what we do is the publishing services we do provide and this is we do as a cost uh, on, uh, as a cost recovery mechanism and as a way of making sure that we're providing sort of high quality hosting preservation and indexing for, um, for journals that, that might need it. So some of those services we provide for free and the hosting, for example, we provide as a, um, uh, as a, as a, commercial, uh, as a commercial offering. But again, it's very much about sort of showing and showcasing what um, it means to provide good publishing services for um, different kind of, mostly for academic journals, but also for monograph and, and, and presses. And now we're, hope we're also going to start for briefings. Um, our journals, for those that, you know, we are very much a global initiative and so for we, we have, this is just some of the location of some of the journals using open journal systems around the world. You can see that we are basically touching on every continent with some places um, like in Indonesia and in Brazil having a very strong presence, but also just having a presence sort of throughout the, um, throughout, throughout the world. And just to talk again, just, uh, just briefly a little bit around how we see the role that the software itself is playing in what it is that we are, uh, that, uh, that we're doing. The software is part of our mission to raise the quality and quantity of uh, public knowledge that's available. We see that providing open source software can lower the barriers to entry, which is allowing more people to participate in, in knowledge production and to be engaging with that uh, global community. We think that our software is helping to streamline the publishing process for whichever, um, whether it be journals or preprints, as a way of lowering the cost and helping to enable more journals to, um, to offer their contents available as open access. We think that the software is designed in such a way that it sort of encourages and it guides people towards best practices around what it means to do good, um, uh, what it means to publish a journal well or to run a good preprint uh, server, uh, how it means to have high quality metadata, right, which improves the quality of that, of that work. Uh, and related to that metadata, the organizing, sort of helping to organize and, and arrange that, uh, that scholarly record by making sure that the software is collecting and having that metadata be uh, organized in a way that's going to be able to be indexed correctly, that's gonna be able to be used upstream in different ways, which is helping to improve the discoverability and also the reuse of, of that work. And so in all of this, you know, why did we decide to venture uh, into preprints? We've been doing the journal publishing software for, uh, for you know, 20 years, and that's been quite, um, with quite a bit of uptake. So why did we move into this preprint, uh, into this preprint space? Uh, we think that preprint sort of presents sort of three different uh, sort of opportunities. 
obviously preprints accelerate discovery. And I think that, you know, we're all living right now that, that the case for preprints has been, um, uh, and the conversation around preprints is sort of more prominent than ever around everything to do with, uh, with the research around COVID-19. Uh, you know, that's my son laughing in, in the background here as he's doing his home, uh, his homeschooling to accelerate um, research discovery. As I was saying around the, the, the research around um, uh, COVID-19 that sort of brought um, uh, the, the role of preprints right to the foreground as we need to make sure that we're working towards disseminating and understanding this virus as, um, as quickly as possible. But the same case can be made actually for all kinds of research across all areas and disciplines around the, the, the need to speed things along. We also think that it also offered us an opportunity to sort of experiment with new technologies, even though we're working um, using the same uh, underlying technology for, uh, as a journal software, it also just gives us an opportunity to sort of try, try out um, new things and start showing and, and, and seeing what it might mean to be working with a brand new, uh, with a brand new platform and new ways of doing things. And here we'll, we can talk a little bit later, you can ask some questions around some of the areas where we're taking the preprint uh, software. And the third is sort of an opportunity. I think preprints are to reinvent how scholarly publishing is, is, is done. And again, I think there's lots of conversations happening today uh, around what it means to do scholarship in this, um, in this way, right? To, to be able to disseminate first through the peer review, sort of as things are being shared, who, how, how it is that um, we organize the dissemination, the organization of the work around publishing first. Uh, and then doing the quality control, the curation, and, and, and understanding what the work means uh, afterwards. And so these are things that we think um, it was valuable to try to get into um, working within preprints to try to make this a uh, new reality in scholarly publishing and preprints as a way of, uh, as a vehicle for making that, uh, making that happen. And so getting into the preprint software itself, so what makes it different from other preprint offerings that are out there. So, you know, there are a lot of, there's other existing preprint servers that are operating on their own software. There's this work from different groups that are, um, that have been trying to offer something in the space. And we could have just left it up to uh, those other groups that are making preprint software to, to, to work in the space. But we thought that we needed, wanted to do things a little bit uh, differently. And there's some reasons why we thought it was important for PKP itself to jump into the preprint, uh, the preprint space. So I want to tell you some of the things that sort of distinguish open preprint systems from uh, other, uh, other softwares that are out there right now. The first, I think, is who is behind it. I think, you know, PKP, we have 20 year history of building software for the community. We have never charged for our software, nor for the support that we make available through the community forum. We've been very active at making sure we're attending to community needs. We have a long history of making our software work well with other people's software and so integrating into the, uh, into the rest of the ecosystem. Um, plus, I think as an academic project, you know, the PKP and, and OPS, you're sort of guaranteed that this is software that's never going to be acquired by a commercial entity that's not always going to be within the hands of, of the community, something that is, um, uh, that, so we think that there's some, some significance about a group uh, like ours taking on a preprint software that, that distinguishes it from, from others. The second is who actually would own, who will own and operate open preprint systems. So although I you know I say, we, say with us who are behind at PKP, but our software is really built specifically in a way to make it so that the community can take it, customize it, and configure it and run it themselves. This is something that even other uh, open source softwares that are out there for, um, for, for different aspects of the scholarly communication ecosystem can't quite uh, claim in, in the same way. Our software really is built so that the community can take it and run it on their own and own it uh, themselves. And the thousands of OJS installs around the world, like in that map, are, are a sign that that's something that works. So PKP, will, we guide the development but the community is the one that takes it, operates it, and makes it, uh, and makes it their own. And the third aspect of what makes open preprint systems different is really who it serves. You know, so our software is actually really built with serious consideration and recognition that scholarship really is best when it's diverse and when it's global. And that's why we make uh, sure that our software takes customizability, multilingualism, and accessibility very seriously. I think that these aspects are, are crucial to making sure that our software won't just serve a singular community from one part of the world operating in a single language from one field of scholarship, but rather that it really can be a software that 
serves a very broad, uh, a very broad community with very diverse needs and very diverse interests in how they and, and, and how they want to communicate and what they want to communicate. But really, you might be wanting to ask sort of what are the specific features of the software itself that that uh, that, that distinguish it. And so I'll just sort of run through a few of these quickly, and then I'll turn it over to Alex so that um, he can sort of give you and actually show you what it looks like, uh, what it actually looks like in practice. First, OPS is going to be super easy to install on very basic infrastructure. Part of this thing around making sure that the software serves broad community means it needs to be easily installed and needs to be able to run on not the latest, most sophisticated software stack, but rather on a standard web server that anyone can have, even on shared hosting platforms. All right, we know that uh, anyone can install a web application in a matter of minutes. We've seen it happen, and, and, and we've seen that libraries can jump in and support getting these things off the ground, but also there's all kinds of sort of opportunities and, and ways of, of doing that with very limited technical expertise. Um, OPS is portable, so I think this is, again, very uh, important around making sure that you're trusting that the software that you're going to have here um, is something that's going to serve you into the future. And if you're ever not happy with it, if you ever if you have any concerns about what's going to happen to PKP or OPS, even though, again, we have a very long track record, um, if you need to change hosts and move it to a different server somewhere, or if you need to get your um, uh, or if you need to grab your software and, and grab the content to take it somewhere else, there's uh, no lock-in to the hosting server that you're using. Very easy to take one installation and put it somewhere else, but also very easy to take the content out and import it into some some other something else if you want in, in the future. Um, like I was saying before, OPS is multilingual. It's already available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. It's not some feature that we're going to roll out in, uh, in, in, in some years that we're going to promise it's going to be available to other languages. It's already available in multiple languages. Uh, and because it shares so many words and, and, and uh, strings with, with Open Journal System, it's actually already partially available in another 15 languages. Um, so that means it's not just the interfaces that are available in, uh, in all of these other languages but content and metadata can actually also be uploaded in multiple languages. Again, serving a global community means multilingualism needs to be um, uh, there from, uh, from day one, and, and it is. And it's not just assumed that everyone will be working in English. Um, and OPS can be configured and extended. It's, it's already, again, built, has a plug-in architecture where people can, can take on. And we've seen this happen again with OJS, and we've already started to see it with, with open proofing systems. We understand that different communities have different needs. And so um, we allow things for customizing things like the uh, theming and making things look different, but also um, having a wide range of screening policies around what you're going to, what kind of content you're going to accept and what that process of curating what goes in and, and out is allowed to look like. We're not trying to lock people into a one size fits all. This is what the server is. So that's what you, that's what you get. And lastly, um, important again, this is part of we have 20 years experience of building things with uh, in this space. And so we know that because it, and because the software shares so much of the code base with open journal systems, we know that OPS already is implementing community standards and best practices around around publishing. Uh, really, uh, from day one, you have um, all of these standards already built in metadata shared in in the standard ways with real interoperability and openness in the spirit of the old openness of the web and making sure the software plays nicely with everything else out there. Um, and these features that I'm just describing sort of embody PKP's ideals of what open scholarly infrastructure looked like, right? And so here, again, if there's anything missing there, we can uh, be happy to, to leave some time at the end so we can sort of have talk about it. But th for us, it was important that this is um, uh, our software really is capturing the spirit of what we think open scholarly infrastructure needs to uh, be able to do. Um, I, before let me just uh, before I just turn over, I just want to sort of say like so our, we rolled out this software about um, uh, about a month ago. Uh, it was in beta, and then uh, or maybe it's a little over a month ago now, but we, it was it continues to be in beta. We'll be out of beta fairly fairly soon. But in that time, um, Cielo has been, uh, who is a partner from day one, has already taken the software and put it into practice. So I just want to, I'll just sort of want to show you very quickly what, that, what that's looked like because they sort of like rolled out and sped up their timelines for releasing the software uh, and putting and releasing the preprint server because of the, um, um, 
the, the pandemic going on and, and they have been prioritizing COVID-19 related preprints. And so they just shared a few stats with me around what's been going on. And I just want to sort of, that way when you're seeing the demo from Alec uh, in a few minutes, you'll be able to sort of get a sense that this software, even though it's in beta designation still, is already being rolled out and it's in, uh, it's in active use today. Um, you know, Cielo um, is the, the Cielo network in, in Latin America, has a lot of similarities with PKP. They've also been around for around 20, 20 years, decided that preprints would be a key component to their approach to rolling out open science um, and believe that sort of, uh, it presents sort of a, a, an opportunity to, um, uh, to help support open science and, and promote open science practices uh, in the region. The preprint server available using open preprint systems already out today at that URL above, preprints.cielo.org. Um, and just a couple of quick stats. So they launched the preprint server on April 7th, so a little over a month ago, um, prioritizing manuscripts from COVID-19. They've already seen 222,000 uh, views of those preprints with uh, some preprints over 7,000 uh, views, and you can see the number of submissions there with, uh, with some different, uh, with you know, some getting accepted and, and some um, them not turning down for various reasons. Um, overall, just I wanted to sort of highlight some of their very first impressions that they've been, like they, they say it on, on the adoption of, of, um, of, of, of the preprint server. Very positive and overall response from the community, including from those that are you know people that are, are the journals themselves that are going to then take some of those preprints and put them through the peer review process, um, and just seeing that response, authors sort of are happy to sort of be able to come in and make up updates and corrections to the preprint using the using the software, uh, and you know they're already seeing how preprints are becoming an integral part of the workflow. So this is in some sense making sure all of those ideals of why we rolled out the software. Are sort of coming into practice at the uh, for for Cielo. Um, they're sort of working with um, on customizing their uh, their installation using a Cielo screening plugin. Uh, this is something that Alec will sort of talk about and show you what different screening process look like. Sort of to have authors check, uh, you know, make you know, to have different ways of sort of speeding up that screening process by looking at author's previous publication history, looking at their affiliations, whether they have an ORCID record. And these are things that maybe I'll just stop talking here and turn it over to Alec to show you because this is an important part around seeing um, how the customization of the software can serve, can be used to serve individual communities like the Cielo, um, uh, like the Cielo preprint server that's, that's out there today. Um, yeah, so that was, I know a lot, I sort of, sort of, Blitz through some of that, uh, sort of highlighting some of those things from the preprint server. But I want to just turn it over to to Alec to actually show you because I'm sure that you're all sort of keen to see what this actually looks like uh, in practice instead of just hearing me sort of describe the the, the general approach. Thanks, Juan. And uh, yeah, let me just set up my screen sharing while we're doing that, so I can get right to it. Um, here we go. And looking for the right window. Got too many windows open apparently. Okay. Can someone confirm that that's uh, that's showing okay? You can see the publishing fest calendar. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. So uh, yeah, first of all, thanks to the Open Publishing Fest for hosting us. Um, I also wanted to say uh, uh, it's good to see some of familiar names on the attendee list. Um, I know I've worked with a number of you over the years uh, on the support forum and, and maybe on the code. Um, and uh, I know you by email addresses and by screen names more than by actual names, but uh, good to see some of you as well. Um, let me see uh, how we'll handle questions. I would suggest if you have any questions, we'll just see how time goes, but um, feel free to add questions to the chat. And Juan, if you can flag me down, if there's something that uh, you'd like to cover in particular, um, I'll see if I can, uh, can jump around a little bit in the demo. This is interactive, so um, I'll try to adjust to uh, what people are interested in. So um, feel free to give me some feedback along the way. But what I'll do is I'll go right into the software and uh, uh, get practical. Um, so as Juan was mentioning, the software is uh, our usual way of releasing open source software. So it's available under the PKP website, under Open Preprint Systems. And uh, if you're interested in toying with this yourself, you can, of course, uh, download and install the software um, from the download link. And as Swan was saying, there's already groups out there that are uh, launching um, with OPS, even though it's still in beta form. There's also a live demo you can uh, use to experiment. Um, I'll be demonstrating off my own laptop. 
Um, so it's similar to the, the, the demo that's live, but uh, not running here locally. Um, about release plans, one mentioned that this is currently in beta and uh, we're planning to currently take the beta designation off the software with uh, the 3.2.1 release, which is due in perhaps a month or two. And uh, so that reflects that we've come over that hump of having a uh, new software that's got um, uh, you know, the attendant number of uh, changes and bugs as we get our early feedback and, uh, and start uh, releasing the software for people to use. And once we get to that 3.2.1 release with the beta designation removed, that marks a level of commitment on our part that um, we're going to be supporting the software and making sure that it's reliable and uh, um, just like we do with all of the rest of our software, OJS and Open Monograph Press. So um, into the demo, and I've unfortunately just lost the chat window. So hopefully somebody can help me to um, jump in with chat questions. Uh, while maybe you could just interrupt me. Um, I don't see that visible here. Anyway, um, this is what you get when you unpack the software and install it on your local server. And uh, one just briefly showed us the, uh, the Cielo preprint server. Um, you can see what it looks like when you put a bit of time into uh, theming. There's a few other examples um, that look different, but we try to um, release the software with a fairly vanilla look and feel just because it wants to be a, a neutral basis for you to use to then add branding and customization and layout uh, to make it look like what you want. It wouldn't be um, as effective if we had a you know uh, very particular and personality rich uh, initial um, theme. So this is what you'll see when you first install it. Um, very neutral, but you can already see here some of the tools to organize the content. Um, likewise, with the Cielo preprint server, they have areas of knowledge. We have here a couple of different. Uh, these are are called series or sections. Um, and I don't have here, but there's additional uh, organization tools like uh, categories you might be familiar with if, you, if you've used OJS before. You can see some of the metadata features of the software in some of these preprints. In particular, uh, this is fairly generic stuff, but you've got your uh, submission title, you've got your authorship information. This is a single author. Uh, you have keywords, and these are entered by the author during the submission process. You have an abstract. And then you have some metadata here around the publication date and so on. And then of course you can view the, the PDF if you want to. So this is based around a very familiar tool set if you've used OJS, uh, Dublin Core, metadata set, um, and, and the usual submission tools you might know from OJS. So uh, no surprises there. Our goal is to take the idea of a preprint, which is you know, blogging for science essentially, and then add some of the, the rigorous tools that we have developed over the years for OJS around you know, multilingual metadata and metadata standards interoperability and bring that to the monograph and make sure that uh, while it is a, a rapid and author controlled form of publication, it still has those, uh, those tools that you'd need to have um, properly indexed and, and well-managed metadata. So that's the front end. Now, what I'll do now is I'll move into the um, author submission process and show you what this would look like from an author's perspective. And I'm going to um, use an existing author account uh, but there's also a registration tool, so an author who's self-registering will be able to uh, do that from scratch. Um, as you can see here, I already have a single submission that's already been published. Uh, I won't look at that just yet, but instead I'll start a new submission. Um, one made reference to multilingual support, and that's one of the things you'll see here. Um, you're going to choose a primary language for the submission, and by default it's the current language you're in, so I'll just leave it as English. And then I also mentioned some of the content organization tools, and uh, here we have two different sections to choose from. Uh, these are configured by the, uh, the manager, so uh, you'll be able to create um, subject designations or perhaps what organizational group you're submitting to, uh, whatever method you want to organize your content. There's several different kind of dimensions you can use to allow for um, administrative organization, but also for content discovery and, and searching. Uh, there's some boilerplate. Again, this can all be set up um, as part of the administration process. And then you'll walk through and right off the bat, um, you will be basically uploading your preprint because this is a much less uh, um, kind of stewarded process than you'd see with, with OJS in a, in a journal. But I'll choose a, a file to upload and I will send it in. Um, and there's tools here that are not visible because this is just a, a straight up preprint file. But if you're uploading artwork, for example, you'd see that there are additional tools here for uh, credit for the artwork, for its uh, resolution for indexing, um, there's a number of rich tools here that I'll just skim past, but that are present depending on 
you know, if you happen to be running a, a medical preprint server where things like medical grade imaging are, are, uh, are of a concern, there's tool sets to support that. Um, we'll jump right into the metadata forms. And uh, I mentioned that we use the Dublin core set. Um, in this case, we only have a few of these fields enabled, um, but there are a, a larger set that you can choose to enable or disable um, to give as much control over um, how richly you index these, either at the point of submission from the author or uh, once you're into a kind of an editorial curation process, if you want to give the editors control to add and uh, curate that metadata more, uh, in a more controlled fashion. I'll just enter some quick metadata. Um, and you can see here, uh, uh, in the interest of um, facilitating good quality metadata in multiple languages, there's the title in English, here's the title in French, and the uh, globe indicator here just goes to show at a glance um, whether content has been added in all uh, forms. And so if I enter some French, you'll see that it'll shift to green to show that all data is, all data is uh, entered. We don't require metadata in all languages, and typically what you'll see is you'll see authors enter in their primary language, and they may enter in a secondary language, and uh, curation will typically happen by the editorial users. Enter a dummy abstract. Um, I'm not going to enter a secondary contributor here, but just to mention the breadth of tools that we've got in the system for, um, for uh, feeding the ecosystem of software. Uh, one of those is ORCID, and um, with an ORCID integration set up here, you'll be able to enter the information about your um, co-authors, and you'll be able to then send them an invitation to um, enter their ORCID and authorize it against the ORCID API so that anything downstream of this system here that um, harvests information from OJS, such as Crossref or Google Scholar, will know that your co-authors have been um, uh, entered with their uh, validation taking place as well. I mentioned keywords. Uh, I'm just going to enter three of those. And let's get through this. OK. So um, one of the things that distinguishes open preprint systems from open journal systems or open monograph press is that, of course, when you're working with preprints, um, the author has a lot more control over what happens with the system, uh, how the content's published. Um, and depending on how you want to run a preprint server, you may give them the tools to directly self-publish, or you may have some kind of screening process. And Juan alluded to that um, earlier when he was talking about uh, different screening plugins. So just to point out here, in this case, the author does not have permission to actually publish the content by themselves. And that's the default behavior that open preprint systems uh, starts with. So what's happened is we've completed the submission process. We've got confirmation that the submission has been sent uh, once I confirm. And that for this user, just because they don't you know, to put up on my laptop. Um, what we have now is um, a, a note that the author cannot publish by themselves and that this now moves on to the purview of the moderator to continue with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just give you a look at what that looks like um, as a moderator. And so I will log out and log back in again. If I can recall my password. Just give me a second. OK, so I've now come in as um, an editorial user. And I can see that there's two submissions in process. And here's the one I just submitted. So this gives you some of the same tools we've already seen. Um, but now it gives you also uh, some editorial control over the workflow. So if you're familiar with OJS, you'll know that there's the peer review, there's the copy editing, there's the proofreading. And what we have here in the preprint server is a much trimmed down um, uh, workflow with some of the same tools for accountability and auditing. So you'll still have activity log to show what's happened with the submission. But essentially what you've got is a big button for publishing. And uh, then from there, once the content moves into, into being published, then there's some additional tools to uh, evolve it in a way that uh, we've introduced to OGS only recently, but previously was a thing that you wouldn't see so much in journals. So what I'll do is I'll schedule for, for publication. We can review the metadata that's come in uh, in a bit of a richer fashion in this case. And then when we're ready, we can publish it. So now we have this note, the version's been published and cannot be edited. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just uh, move us into the published site and show you what that looks like. I think that was the one I just published. So we have all the information we just entered, uh, an abstract, keywords, and in this case, it was published by the, uh, the editorial user going through and doing the publication. Um, I'm just going to um, show you what another screening policy might look like. 
So I'm going to log in as a site administrator. The reason I'm logging in here as a site administrator is because I'm going to go to the plugin gallery, which uh, will allow me to discover and install plugins from the ecosystem. And in this case, what I'm interested in is plugin gallery. Uh, which one is it now? It's called the returning author screening plugin. And this plugin is not currently installed, installed in the system, but if I wanted to install it, I can press the install button. It describes what it does here. The plugin permits authors who already have at least one published submission to self-publish subsequent submissions. So a lot of screening policies are a matter of establishing trust with the author. If you simply open up a preprint service for anyone to uh, submit content, it'll get spam. And so uh, in looking for requirements for the open preprint systems application in, in its design and implementation, we had a lot of conversations with groups um, who uh, had different ideas for what that screening should look like. So as I mentioned, our default policy is that the administrator has to take an editorial action. In this case, uh, this is an alternative where you establish a level of trust um, after the first submission gets published, and that's still a manual action, where after the first one gets published, there's been some manual vetting of that user's contribution, and we give them the, uh, the trust uh, to be able to publish their own content afterwards. So um, if this plugin had been installed, when I made that second submission as the author Zeta Woods, when I reached the end of the submission process, because I already had an additional, uh, an, an existing submission that was published, I would have been able to self-publish that second submission. So if you have returning authors, this is one example. But it also demonstrates the, uh, the ecosystem view of the software and the fact that there is no kind of one, sits all, one size fits all um, uh, screening policy. So what we're seeing already and we'll be seeing in the future is that different groups who have their own screening policies and might have the capability to uh, do a bit of work to implement that will be able to do so and then share those screening policies so that um, there's a richness to the software uh, that would not be possible if we just imposed a single rule upon how a screening uh, process should work. So I want to take a second and look at the multilingual content again. And this is going to be a segue into versioning. Um, let's say that we published this submission here. And I don't think I actually entered uh, anything in a secondary language. I think it was just uh, the primary language. Um, let's say I want to make a correction to the abstract or to maybe translate the title. And one thing you'll see here in the back end is that we have, in this case, we have two languages. But as one mentioned, we have um, currently available for open preprint systems. There is uh, Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, and Spanish. Those are both thanks to Cielo's work. Um, I believe French is present. And we have bits and pieces of other languages coming along as well. Uh, this is brand new software, and so uh, translations take some time. But each time we make a new release, we gather together the community's work on translations, and we improve uh, what goes out. And uh, I think before long, we'll see additional languages start to come our way. But uh, what you can do is you can uh, toggle an additional language here uh, using this top tool set, um, and then enter additional content in uh, different languages. But I can't currently. And the reason for that is because the version has been published and cannot be edited. And this is a feature called versioning that we introduced with OGS 3.2. It's uh, an original contribution from the Free University of Berlin uh, back in 2016. And has been quite a lot of work to get uh, released, but also represents um, some really important functionality for open preprint systems, but also for OGS and OMP. And when one makes reference to the shared library, what that means is that there's a fundamental tool set of scholarly publishing software that we essentially are able to adapt and extend and rebrand to, uh, to make OJS, to make OPS, to make OMP. And we're, if we're able to add a feature to that core uh, shared library, that becomes available in all the software. So in that sense, an improvement to OJS improves OPS and OMP. Um, and an improvement to OPS likewise improves the others. So this feature of versioning um, prevents me from editing the metadata here. Um, and I have two options. If I wanted to sneak under the wire and make a little tweak that didn't uh, represent um, uh, a new version of the software, a new uh, release of this particular monograph, I could just unpublish, make the tweak, and then republish. And that would be um, kind of sneaking through an edit. But if you want to um, uh, follow a better practice, what you can do now is create a new version. And what this does is it tracks, uh, tracks the changes against the previous version. So uh, although I'm changing a published submission, um, both the new version and the old version will be um, available. So what I'll do is I'll just enter uh, a title in French. I'll correct English abstract, abstract, maybe enter some French content here. But you could imagine I could also be revising the author list. 
I could be um, uh, up updating the PDF file that was attached. I could do any of those things. And then when I was ready, you can see here now I've got two versions. What I can do is I can publish the second version. What I'll do now is I'll go into the site. You see there's the test submission. And what you can see now is there's two different versions uh, and they're numbered and they have dates attached to them. And what I'm looking at default is the new ones. I've got the modified abstract uh, and I can flip back to the older one to see that we have both versions now tracked. So when you're moving the publishing into the hands of the author and uh, giving them control over this, you're losing the kind of rigor that would usually go into the editorial process for, let's say, a journal or a monograph, which means that you are potentially having the published content um, evolve a lot more chaotically than you would for a journal article. Um, what this allows you to do is to bridge that gap and still have tracking of the previous uh, article versions. So if this preprint gets cited, and let's say there's a modification that substantially changes uh, the preprint, um, that the citation will actually go to a particular version and there's an indication if there is a revision that this version is now outdated. So I'll go back to the current version. The last thing I wanted to show on that is the English language, French language. And so I believe I don't actually have French enabled on the front end, I don't think. No, I'm, I've, I've got a, um, a switcher to enable on here. But if, if I had the switcher enabled for languages, I'd be able to um, switch over to French and I would see transparently, not only would the software's interface language change, uh, that's things like the, the search bar, archives, all these navigation tools that come with the software, but also the metadata that I've entered would, uh, would change over to French. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna spend a few minutes on the administration area and show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna go back into the, the backend tool set. I mentioned that there's additional tools here that come with uh, OPS to add the scholarly rigor to what otherwise would be more akin to a blog. That includes tool set, uh, statistics tools like um, uh, reports, uh, uh, counter uh, reports, that kind of thing. Um, and the bulk of it is going to be in uh, your setup. And this is where I mentioned uh, all the boilerplate uh, that uh, you would be dealing with when you're um, looking at a submission. That's all configurable here. So there's all these fields where you can inform the user about what your preprint server is like, uh, what its policies are. You can add some tools to organize content. We saw that when I started a submission, there was uh, preprints and reviews were among the options. But you can create those arbitrarily. And you can see here the information to control how they work, whether they're abstract or not, whether they're available for anyone to submit to or just your managers and moderators, et cetera. Um, you can also assign moderators to uh, each of these um, different sections. And uh, that might lead to automatic assignments. If you're running a service that has a very large volume of submissions coming in, this would then allow you to automatically assign these users to uh, incoming submissions based on what the author designates as a, as a section. Um, more for the front end, unless for the uh, editorial back end and workflow, there's this area here called categories. And this allows you to create, uh, commonly this would be something like a subject area, but you can have nested subject areas here, like you might have uh, physics. And then uh, let's just say description of some sort. And then within physics, you might have a subcategory called cosmology, et cetera. Um, and this allows you to designate a hierarchy of content that you can then uh, browse from the front end. I think actually those won't, those won't show up because I don't have any content in those, but you can imagine those being almost a tree view of the content you can then browse um, to, to look through. So as you can see, uh, we only have a bit of test content here um, in the installation, but as new submissions come in and as the amount of content uh, um, collects, naturally OJS is organized by year and by issue. Um, this is a much more flat publication model, and so it's helpful to give some tools to allow for uh, content to be organized. And of course, you do have uh, things like full text search. Um, just to jump back into the back end and go over some of the tools that um, are available to, um, to managers to participate in the publishing ecosystem. I did look at plugins briefly uh, before, but I want to just point out that uh, what this also comes with is things like Google Scholar for uh, indexing in that tool set you have cross-ref deposits, you have DOIs. So all the things that you are familiar with if you're publishing in journals um, are also available here. And um, like I say, that's part of being uh, the benefit of having 
open preprint systems uh, developed alongside OGS and OMP. So as we continue to add support for additional ecosystem uh, components here, then that will uh, frequently become available for open as well. So um, I'm about to wrap up here, so I'm about to move on to questions, but on release plans, I mentioned that uh, this is still in beta. Uh, what we've been doing since, the, uh, since OPS was originally released is we have been uh, refining it with additional fixes uh, within the downloads area. I think the first release of OPS only came out in the end of February, uh, the very last day of February. It was a very long day, as I recall. Um, and since then, we released a few additional builds to just uh, iteratively improve on, on that software. Still in the 3.2.0 beta release. But the next one to come out, as I mentioned, is in uh, a month or, or perhaps a bit more than that. It'll be called OPS 3.2.1. It'll be released simultaneously with OGS and OMP 3.2.1. And uh, we'll represent the first release that we remove that beta designation on. So at that point, you'll be able to um, rest assured that we're going to have uh, upgrade support and uh, the support form will be very active on OPS and it'll just join that same stable of tools that we've been supporting for so long um, with the rest of our software in, in OMP and, and OGS. Um, since the release of OPS, uh, we've seen a few of these installations pop up and they're all still fairly uh, germinal because the software is so new and uh, they're still working out uh, how they're advertising for authors and how they're distinguishing themselves. I think CLO is the best example of these and uh, it already has content and it's quite impressive. I have to congratulate them on their work so far. Um, we're also seeing as the software uh, gets more attention, uh, translations come in. And I mentioned we have Spanish, we have Portuguese, we have uh, partial French translation. Uh, we have Indonesian for that matter coming in, uh, some work on German, uh, quite a long list. And most of these are, are just begun, um, but what we have here is a tool set to allow for users who are out there to contribute to the translation and make sure that that translation work um, can be done in concert with other translators into the same language. So if you have um, several people interested in working on a particular language, they can collaborate and make sure that they aren't uh, duplicating the same work. And then this uh, gets merged into uh, the next release of the software. So um, when we're preparing a release, I'll come through and sure that any contributions that are made to this website um, are packaged up and sent out with the next release of the software. So our, our translation tool set has become a lot easier to use and much more collaborative. And I would invite anybody who's interested in working with this to um, uh, find uh, uh, information on WebLate and on translations in the PKP documentation and uh, join up and start uh, working with the other translators who are here to make sure that that software is available to our global users. Um, I mentioned the plugin ecosystem and the, uh, the screening plugin that I, I, I gave a quick tour of around returning authors being allowed to publish content. Um, that plugin is uh, written by NTUC Nygaard, who is the developer who was responsible for um, most of the work on OPS. And um, uh, this is what it looks like when a community member, in this case NTUC, wants to contribute a plugin to the ecosystem. Uh, they write that plugin, they put it somewhere uh, online, typically in GitHub, they package it up and then because we have this tool set in the form of a plugin gallery, that then becomes uh, available um, to users who want to install it without them needing to understand that uh, they are working with a community plugin beyond there being some indication of a level of trust with that developer. And anything that's um, listed here in the plugin gallery, we do vet uh, for some basic requirements to make sure that they're trustworthy. But um, if you're interested in contrib contributing back to the software in that form, that's also available to you. Um, so uh, that would then build on this list of plugins that are available uh, to the community here for installation on their own machines. Uh, last thing I'll mention is the community forum. And this is where I know some of you from. Um, this is where uh, a lot of our community comes to commu communicate about the software. And um, frequently it's a technical discussion because this is where a lot of uh, uh, Q&A, technical Q&A, also bug fixes, uh, feature requests, all that sort of thing. Um, happens amongst our community. But I really do invite anybody who uh, may not have technical backgrounds, may not have a, a technical question, anybody's welcome here. And in particular, really welcome things like feature requests. Um, because OPS is such a new application, such a new piece of software, we're still gathering feedback on um, uh, what parts of it work well, where we didn't uh, meet your needs and requirements. So I invite anybody who's got feedback for us to come here and, uh, and post it. And uh, don't be put off by the technical nature of the forum. We really do welcome all kinds of posts and questions. Um, if you are starting out with OPS uh, and you run into a problem, then this is a good place to post. And uh, I'm active here. A number of community members are active here. And uh, it is a place for the community as a whole and not just for kind of us to, to moderate and host. 
Um, I've got to find my chat windows and figure out what uh, kind of questions we've got, um, which might take me a minute. But maybe in the meantime, Juan, if you want to uh, relay some feedback and if there's anything I can answer. Yeah, I've been fielding questions in the, in the chat, so you're, you're in the clear there, except for one from Kave, who was asking something that I wasn't sure the answer of, which is around um, whether the categories are, there's a, whether there's a control vocabulary for those, or whether those are, it's just an open field where people can continue. Sure. I thought I knew the answer, but I'm not confident, so I wanted to ask that to you. But also, while you answer that, um, just to tee up other people, you, you can feel free to uh, ask another question in the chat, or just unmute your microphone and uh, and, and jump on. You should be able to, to unmute yourselves if you want to ask it uh, in audio. Otherwise, just type it in to the chat um, while, uh, while Alec is, is answering the question around categories. I've lost my mute button. Um, so categories are currently um, not a controlled vocabulary. Um, well, they are insofar as the editor needs to set them up, the manager needs to set them up. And currently that's a manual process to key those in. We do have, we do have a number of questions about uh, using a pre-configured vocabulary for those features. And um, I believe there's a bug issue open, a bug entry open that discusses some ways of doing that. Um, and it is something we will support at some point. The major stumbling block for us on that is that um, as soon as you discuss controlled vocabularies, it's very hard to find one that is um, both uh, free uh, in license terms for us to use and available in multiple languages. So uh, while I would love to uh, actually release the software with um, options for keywords to be a, a, a predefined um, third party vocabulary, it simply isn't a good one available to us. So I think two things I would say. One is that we will add some additional tools for um, easier curation and import and export of, um, of categories from, let's say, a, a predefined list. And also, if you do have information on a, a vocabulary that you would find helpful, um, please do let us know, especially if it's um, got a permissive uh, license around its IP and also if it's available in multiple languages. Um, I saw another question about open review, I think, and I just wanted to mention that quickly. Um, there are, there is no review tool set in the software in open preprint systems because that's one of the distinguishing factors uh, from open, open journal systems or open monograph for us. But there are uh, two tools here that um, permit that to happen in a more preprinty sort of way. If I look at the front end here, I can browse, uh, let's just say there's the, the, the monograph. Um, I've got additional plugin tools uh, to install Hypothesis. Is that going to work? Yes. So what I could do here is actually install the Hypothesis plugin. And I'm going to take a flyer and actually click the button and see what happens. I may not be able to do this. There we go. And if I look now into uh, the plugin list, I should see Hypothesis now appears. So what's now just happened is I've, I've taken that plugin from uh, a GitHub source code repository and installed it into my uh, system here. And now what I can do, because it's installed locally now, is I can enable it. And I don't think there's any settings there. And I believe what'll happen now is if I reload, yeah, I don't see it here. It actually would show up on the, uh, the, the view. And I think this version of the PDF reader doesn't actually support it. But what you can do is um, with a few clicks, um, when you're not doing a live demonstration, you can add support for Hypothesis to come in and add for commenting tools to appear directly on the submission. And so this is effectively open peer review. Um, other questions coming up here that I could address? I've just been answering. There's a question around using it for electronic thesis and dissertations. And, and I was just, uh, just responding there that um, I think we've seen a lot of with OJS as well, a lot of like really um, sort of uses that we never quite intended. Uh, and I think that ETDs might be one uh, use where o OPS, uh, not having a, you know, not having to do that big review process, which you wouldn't do on thesis and dissertation, which are already um, have been reviewed outside of any system as part of their formal um, uh, academic process. Um, this would be a place where you just have some screening policies and the customization on the screening policies means that you can sort of curate and let's say, for example, having people have to validate having email addresses from your institution or, or having policies where you, you know, somebody is over, going them over like a librarian looks over those similar as they would in a repository, but you might have them contained. So, so these are, you know, we can, we, we haven't seen these uh, kind of uses yet. This is someone else was asking earlier if there was any big, good examples of large sort of, of installations using OPS and I just wanted to emphasize this offer. Uh, I keep saying one month, but it's just because I feel like since March, the amount, like time, 
the, the passage of time and how we measure it and how I understand it has changed. But your Alec is right, we released this at the last day of February. So it hasn't been out very long in the wild. It's only been out there um, since essentially for two and a bit months and it was still in beta. It's just gonna be coming out of beta soon. Um, so Cielo really is the big flagship um, uh, practical live use installation. And I think as their partners, they were very sort of already familiar with the software and ready to jump on board with it. Uh, and then you have met their needs. Um, but we think we've been seeing other test installs coming up. We know that in archive was just tweeting at me today that they are going to be releasing their um, a sort of first trial uh, installation of in archive running OPS. And we know that others are also experimenting with it. So we think we'll start seeing more as the year goes on. But right now, the um, the largest sort of installation that's out there is the Cielo preprint server. And as I was sharing a little bit earlier, they've had some uh, some success already in getting it off, off the ground. Um, still looking for some of the features that are still coming as we continue to be actively developing it. Um, and this is something that uh, we are still actively working on adding uh, sort of new features and finishing rounding out those that are there. And I think as the community starts uptaking and making their own adjustments and maybe writing their own plugins, you start to see this become a more um, complete uh, software solution. As you yeah, have- Just actually on, on thesis and dissertations, uh, actually I hadn't considered OPS uh, for that yet, but we have seen it show up in, in, I think both OGS and OCS back in the day, where people would use it for that, that purpose. Um, one of the side effects of, uh, of extending our software to the same core software tool set to approach different um, types of publications is that we get a better idea for what the platonic um, scholarly publication is. We started out with OJS and we've been doing OJS now for, for something like two decades, which is crazy. Um, but uh, when we originally took on doing OCS on top of, uh, conf that's conference software on top of doing uh, journal publishing as well, um, by looking at the differences between those two uh, publishing models, we got a better sense for what was the platonic uh, submission and what was a, a conference paper versus what was a journal article and now with OMP what's a, a monograph and I think we're getting a much better idea of what we can share between those applications um, and how best to share it and then what needs to be a uh, concern for a journal article versus a, a, a monograph versus a, a preprint. The closest to the bone amongst those different publication types is uh, um, a preprint because you remove um, features like uh, Onyx, if you're looking at uh, monographs, you remove features like issue-based publication and, uh, and all that kind of stuff if you're looking at journals. And what you're left with is just um, a submission, the metadata sets that describe it, and then some kind of uh, a policy around screening to permit the author to self-publish or to restrict them from doing that. And then once things are published, you've got a very similar tool set based on the submission that can be used to add uh, you know, uh, additional versions, uh, expose content, index content, add commenting. And from that sense, OPS is, as I say, closest to that platonic, but also it's quite close to what a thesis process would look like. So I think if you were to experiment with um, OPS for thesis and dissertations, what you'd find is that you'd be able to find uh, a combination of settings and maybe a couple of plugins uh, that are already available that would give you as close to uh, um, like an expert moderation type approach. Um, without adding, without requiring any additional uh, tweaking to the software. One more thing I'll add, um, at the risk of getting off into the weeds here, is that uh, there's a plugin that's available to the software called the custom locale plugin. What that allows you to do is to modify all the wording on the software, uh, you know, some of the basic things like uh, what, what dashboard is, you can change this wording here, by using that plugin to just tweak uh, any labels that you want to modify. And so if you find that you want to adapt uh, OPS for theses and dissertations, that plugin can come in handy in allowing you to modify the contents um, without having to you know, modify the software. Um, the one caveat I will say is that people have in the past um, invested a lot of time into repurposing the software um, through a variety of means, maybe actually modifying the code, maybe changing the labels, all that kind of thing, and then not uh, consider the time it takes to maintain that modification, that set of, uh, of customizations or adaptations. And uh, what you can do if you're not careful is end up uh, um, with a fork of the software or an effective fork of the software um, that gets left behind the ongoing um, evolution of the software and then you get stuck on an old version and a lot of time invested to get it there and no way forward. So just be aware that you are taking on some maintenance uh, requirements if you do go that, that way. Just like any uh, open source application uh, that uh, you install, it does have to get maintained as well. 
Okay, uh, I think we're at, we're at the hour, and uh, I know that there's, uh, um, hopefully, I mean, there, there might be still questions. Uh, it might be good. Can you just flash up the place and maybe on the, just flash up the forum URL just for people to have there? I know that that's a place where you can come with additional questions if you have curiosities around. Um, so you can see it at the top there, forum.pkp.sfp.ca. So, um, so we'd welcome just feedback on what you've seen here today, questions around what might be coming down. Uh, and what you might need, uh, even just explaining out some of your own requirements if you're considering taking on uh, the use of the software. Um, and so just go ahead and, and jump on to the, to the forum and let us know, or just jump on Twitter and give us some feedback. We'd love to hear more. We you know we've talked at you fairly quickly for a, full, uh, for a full hour here. I think we're the two fastest talkers at PKP. And so uh, maybe we should uh, have some of the slower speaking people do demos, but Alec and I were really happy to have a chance to, uh, to do this today. Um, so um, thanks for taking the time and for, uh, for your interest, and we'd love to, to hear from you as we go forward. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you on the forum. Okay. Bye-bye.